Howdy folks, old Buster coming to you again. A little bit under the weather today, but we're going to try to get these last two stories all in for you. This is called What You Thinking? Well, what you thinking, hollered hired to Jesse. Buster C. rode up on his and gray, Smokey. Buster told Walter that Jesse was always a thinking before Jesse could answer him. Well, Jesse sure enough had something on his mind these past few days, and Buster, for the life of him, just couldn't figure out what all it was. Leastways, Jesse wasn't saying nothing about it. Well, Buster was helping Jesse hold his and Ma's truck patch, and sure enough, Buster had his and rag and gloves and them big Smith overhauls of his. Well, it was a Saturday morning, and Hired was just finishing up helping his pa moving some equipment to another job before he met up with him. Well, all the levees were budded at the farm, so Buster was pretty much free that Saturday, too. Walter had to retro for the draft at the courthouse, so he was done for the day as well. Now, most Saturdays, the courthouse was closed, but there were so many folks that farmed and ranched around there about that Mrs. Nash would come in on Saturday to help them out. Well, now, her gal, Billy Jane, went out with John Dale Robb, and they all went to the schoolhouse together with the boys. Now, Billy Jane and her ma and pa lived just down the road from Walter, so Miss Nash knowed from Miss Ollinger that there was work aplenty, and this Saturday morning was allowed for Walter to go to town. Instead of riding in with them, he rode on over on Old Smokey and then went on over to Jesse's place. Well, Jesse sure enough wasn't doing some hay scratching and wasn't making no moans about telling on his himself neither. But all the boys know they would know what it was on his mind in Jesse's own good time. Well, dinner time done come round and all the boys had gathered up by then and Miss Ollinger and Miss Holmes and Buster's Grandma Clara come on by on the way to home demonstration meeting to get Miss McBrayer. Now, all them ladies knowed each other from way back and had been friends before the boys was even born. They remembered when Buster's grandma took in Buster since the time he was two months old. Now, Buster's mama worked out over at the airport during the war, and there just wasn't no place for no youngin, baby especially. And in them days, folks took care of the home. Well, all the boys had been thick as sorghum molasses since they was born. Buster was the oldest, and then Jesse next, then come Walter and Hired. I'm a telling you, just cause them boys was country don't mean they ain't smart as a whip neither now. Well, later on in life, them boys done some things brain-wise, and each of them had a heart of gold. The raisin they all had was the best, even though all of them was some what different. Well, Buster's was like they done in the old country in Czechoslovakia, where his and mama's people hail from. But they was all honest as the day was long, and worked hard and saved their money. Well, after one heck of a dinner that Ms. McBrayer fixed up for the boys and women folks, they all left on out. Well, Jesse said to stop by Leak's Drug Store first, and they would take the back booth and visit first pal, Plabber. Well, Jesse, uh, always had an idea, you know. Well, Buster told Walter and Hired to watch out, cause here it comes. Jesse's gonna tell them what all has been on his and mine. And sure enough, he done just that. Now, after a bit of ice cream, the boys left on out of walking down Main Street as they seed Mr. Cables pointing a his and finger at something or the other whilst he was a-talking to a feller. Now, funny thing is, that finger was the one that a squirrel done bit, and it was straight as a poker, and a bit gnarled up to two, uh, to boot. Him a-waving that metal finger sure took folks by surprise, I tell you. Kind of reminded the boys of Ollie the Mare down on in then by Old Bridge. He always told the story of the feller getting his finger bit by a coon. He said a squirrel or a beaver was worse than that. Lo Ollie just squatted in the shack on the side of the bio, just the odds and ends of boxes and crates and old cast off folks throwed away in the garbage heap was what made his a living space from, with his hounds. He done had a parcel of hounds that kept him company and slept with him too. Boy I had a smell eye in a line. Now the county would come by ever so often and clean up the garbage pile and he would throw a hissy fit about all that I tell you. He said he needed that stuff out of there. Never seen so much dirt caked on a feller, but I guess you couldn't expect much seeing how gumbo mud was sticked about pretty near anything. Well, Buster done come out and told the boys they was going to go to Canada on a train ride, and he done got the tickets so they was non-refundable. Well, Jesse done about come unglued, I'm telling you. Thought he was going to stroke out. He don't waste no money on nothing and sure ain't going to lose none on an airplane or a train ticket. 
Well, Jesse told Buster that he didn't really know if he could make it or not. Well, Buster told him he had to go since the tickets was done bought and paid for. Walter and Hired told Jesse they was going to hogtie him and let Buster sit on him too if he didn't allow to go with him. Well, Jesse said he done figured on doing what he set out to do about his and thinking on the project and just didn't have the time. Well, the boys told him he would just have to make the time and put his IDs on the back burner till they got on back. Well, Jesse had been reading up on a feller by the name of Nikolai Tesla. He was some kind of smart feller back in the day and had some pretty radical IDs, some folks said. Well, anyhow, Jesse done got the notion, so to speak, a kind of dissipating ray that could spread a small amount of stuff over a wide area. Well, Jesse done got a whole bunch of information from his learning at the University of Alabama, and it weren't all about lawyer neither. Well, Jesse done made up a natural, organic pesticide insecticide whew, from them creams he was always a fooling with, and the neem tree. Well, Buster knows something about that there tree, too, and seen one in person at the Como Zoo Conservatory there in Minnesota when he went to visit Lulu's folks up there. Well, Buster was right on track with Jesse on that subject, because he sure thought it would be a good idea to use it on a farm. Whilst all this was all well and good, Walter and Hire just needed to be brought up to speed on this here confabbing. Well, that was done in short order, and Jesse pulled out some notes and papers and let them all read what all he said about the name tree and give them all that information. Of course, Buster done know all that. He liked that old name tree, Buster did. Well, Jesse said that he wanted Walter to weld up a gizmo he come up with and he wanted Hired to adapt it to a piece of farm machinery with Walter. Well, next off, he wanted Buster to help him out on mixing and experimenting and to bring up Belle and outfit her if the farm machinery worked. Well, seemed like an awful big undertaking, and Buster says to the boys that the tickets was bought and paid for, and they was going to take that dang trade ride, come here, if it even hair like the ugly ape. He just wasn't going to put up no shenanigans about that. Well, anyhow, Buster liked train, and since he never got to play with his and Christmas present of an Indian that his mama got it for Christmas, he was bound and determined that him and the boys were going to make this here trip. Well, they all went. Buster said they could work on the plans as they rode the train. The boys caught the Amtrak train there in Little Rock and was going to go whichever way the wind blowed them, to Banff, Canada, or into Alaska and all points in between. The thing is, Jesse told the boys, is that all these dang chemicals is going to kill this planet and folks to boot if something wasn't done. Folks was hungry in this old world and needed help. Well, Jesse said the folks they seen in Zambia proved that. Well, the captain had been a-talking to DACA, and between the food shortage and the malaria and then gay fever problem, his and village and other folks there was in bad trouble. Well, DACA asked if and Jesse and the boys might figure out a way to help them some. Well, Jesse told DACA that he would cipher on it and see if and they might come up with something. Appeared like he done just that. Well, Buster laid out the route they was a-taking with options of changing the direction or plan along the way, throwed in for good measure. It now here had a bunch of old stuff there to, to show the boys, which he did. And the thing about it is, is that if y'all wrote Buster and the Boys at Yahoo.com, I could send you every bit of that stuff. So much would be left out. First stop, St. Louis, Missouri. Now Walter done told all the boys he just had to see how they done built up their arch. You see, Walter done took up drafting and welding for quite a spell now, and nobody really knowed all this but the boys. Well, Buster told them all since they was in St. Louis on this here long trip, he wanted to try some barbecue whenever they stopped. Well, Jesse piped up and said he sure enough loved barbecue too and wanted to try the different kinds they had. Well, when the boys got to the arch, the gateway arch they called it, Walter took on off on his and own to see how that thing was built. Along the way, he met up with the maintenance folks and an engineer inspecting the darn thing. Well, don't you just know it, them boys cottoned old Walter right off the bat and took him inside and out of that there arch. Well, heck fire, he pretty well knowed all there was to know about the thing before he was done. They even let Walter help do some of the maintenance work whilst he was with them. Well, he sure enough had plenty to tell when he got done, I tell you. The boys was all hungry as all get out too, and when he got back and listened to every dad gum thing he had to say in detail whilst eating that barbecue at C&K on Jennings Station Road. Buster was in hog heaven with them sweet tater pies. He done ate two of them before they left out. 
Well, Walter told him that the arch was 630 foot tall and 630 foot wide. All the measurements were took at night so the sun uh, shimmering wasn't going to mess up the calculations and building the thing. Walter had a passel of facts about the arch and the engineer uh, and uh, all the facts that the engineer gave him and he sure did have a rip roaring time telling all the boys about it. He got so long winded that he made them miss their train and they had to spend the night so they could catch the next train out. Well, Buster said he was glad they wasn't on no set timetable or they'd be in a pickle for sure and they was only on their first stop. Well, Walter showed the boys all that information and told them all about the thing, you know. Well, the boys kept the talking up into the night and Jesse told them he had some information too about the old courthouse. Now, Jesse was right interested in that since he was taking up lawyering at the University of Alabama. And then he told all the boys what he found out about it and what not. And as I say, we got all this stuff, pictures and everything, if you would just write old Buster and the boys at yahoo.com. Well, it was getting now on to 1 a.m. in the morning before the boys got to bed. Hired had the last word, though. Visiting was right fine, but him and Buster was fuller than a tick on barbecue and sweet tater pie, but he had a little surprise for them. Well, Hired done brung out a dozen peach and a dozen apple fried pies for the lot of them and a jug of old McBrayer. Said day was set for the day. Well, Buster turned off all the lights and the snoring commenced. Second stop, Chicago, Illinois. Well, Buster said if a neighbor was going to see a ball game twixt the Cubs and the White Sox, he ought to bring on his shooting iron. They get plum fractures, he said. He was going to eat the best hot dogs there was at Wrigley Field and with all the trimmings. Well, that was sure enough to get them all a-going. Well, after the game, the boys took a tour on the tour bus and seed all the sights in Chicago, Illinois. After spending the night, the boys headed on out to the next stop. The third stop was Banger, Maine. Well, Buster said, boys, I got a surprise for y'all. Remember when we come to Maine and eat them oversized crawdads? Well, the feller that sells the bestest has got a little shindigger going on with what they call a lobster and crab burrow. It just, it's just his and family and a few friends and when I called him up while I was setting up his trip, he done invited us to spend the evening and eat about with him. Now the feller's name is Cap Morrill. He done made a pretty darn good living at fishing too. He told me to tell y'all to bring an appetite now. They is going to have plenty to eat and a fixin' to boil up a pot full of them live Maine lobsters. Woo! And with the choicest stammer clams and sweet black mussels to be had. Melt in your mouth bacon wrapped scallops and shrimp cocktail and then a selection of rich and creamy New England chowders with sweet corn and red taters to boot. Now for dessert they're going to have them banger brownies, cheesecake and blueberry pie. Well, Buster said he just couldn't wait to put a lip lock on them kind of eats, that's for sure. Whilst at the supper, Cap put on, one of the fellers there said it was a little contest the next day and they might be interested in it. Well, all the loggers got together once a year for a little contest, and he thought it would be right interesting for the boys. The boys seed all manner of events that a logger would do in making his and living. A sawing and climbing poles like trees and throwing axes, and a thing called burlin. What is really log rolling was some of the things the loggers was competing in. Now, the feller that told them to come and see the events come with a bunch of other fellers and got all the boys to try that there log rolling. Berlin. Now that was a sight to see, I tell you. Buster didn't even make it to get on the darn log, let alone stand up on that thing. He was just too big. Well, his balance wasn't no good neither. Walter finally got up on his and, but like to have runt and hiss himself, when he fell off, he straddled the darn thing. Well, Hire and Jesse done pretty good at staying on their logs, but when they put a feller on each of their logs is when all the flailing of the arms and the hollering began. Well, Jesse and Hired would go pretty quick, but not quick enough. Both of them hit the water all oh, after about two or three of them log rolls. Needless to say, all the boys got water in the frog, but dried out pretty quick, just a grinning and a having a big old time. Now, supper was light, saying how the picnic lunch was more than a feller could eat in a week. Another night, and off again. Of course, Walter had to get the boys out for a beer, and Jesse give a taste of old McBrayer to the bartender to show him what really a good whiskey tasted like. Feller wanted to keep the whole dang bottle, but Jesse said he could get some from Aunt Judith if and he would write her and give him the address. Fourth stop, Boston, Massachusetts. Well, Buster just had to have some, some of them 
Dim Sum Dumplings there in Chinatown he heard about. Uh, so off they went, uh, went to get some of them things. You know, uh, Louis Chan made the best there was for the concern over in Wallace, their friend. The boys was at a big old table and all four of them ordered the biggest mess of stuff you ever did see. Heck, fire they didn't know from Adams All Fox what they was a doing, so they took the advice of the waiter and just ordered what sounded good. Well, Buster laid into them dumplings like nobody's business. Them Chinamen didn't know what to think of what all that boy could put away. Well, all the boys seemed to hold their own, and it wasn't long till they cleaned all their plates. Well, with their bellies fuller than a tick, they took off to see the sights. The boys decided to sigh follow and gone around a bit, seeing how Walter and Jesse was going to take all day anyhow. Them boys was sure to get into every nook and cranny, and Twix hired Walter to taking pictures, it was going to take some time. Now Buster figured on this, so he planned on the afternoon, and next day before they would hate on out. Like he told all the boys, they'd get back when they got back. There sure enough was some history there in Boston, and it was a right interesting place to see just where things got to popping for America's independence. Danged if and there wasn't a lot of things to see now. Buster was wondering if he allowed enough time, cause they just got started on this trip. The pictures never was Buster's long suit, but even though he deviled Walter and Hire about taking so many of them, he dearly loved to look at them. Sometimes in the evenings after supper, Buster would just sit out on the porch in the cool of the evening breeze and look over all the pictures that was took since he know Walter hired and Jesse and the places they been and the folks they met and know and the things they done. Well, the boy didn't know it. Buster was fixing up some picture albums for each one of them as a surprise for Christmas. To go along with that, a kind of scrapbook of doodads and clippings and whatnot was being made for him too. Every time they went summers, Buster would try to get Four of everything, so each one of them had a keepsake. Well, Buster wasn't a mite sentimental about things like that, you know, and this trip was downright meaningful to Buster, and he knowed each one of the boys appreciated it too. Well, Jesse would always kick up a fuss of saying he was too busy, but he really liked Buster to plan and figure it all out. When he got on a trip, he really didn't care about going back anytime soon. Well, Walter and Lou Ann and hired now Alma May uh, had them to thank. Uh, about now, but one thing about them gals, they knowed how it was with them four boys. They all had time doing things at home as well, but the trips sure enough had excitement and adventure in them. They was always getting into something summers. They spent the night at the Parker House Hotel, America's longest continuously operating luxury hotel, and had a heck of a supper with Parker House rolls and Boston cream pie for desserts. It was a fine supper, but nothing like the cooking of their mamas and grandmas back home. As the boys was pulling out the train station, Walter said aloud if they reckoned that the midnight ride of Paul Revere was on a gray. Well, you know that boy loved them gray horses. Fist stop, New York, New York. Well, sir, all the boys knowed about New York and wanted to make sure and see all there was to see and that they could see. And Buster had planned out too, but wanted the boys to put in their two cents worth of what they wanted to see and do. Now Buster was a Yankees fan and just had to go see them just once if and they was in town to plan. Something good to eat was always in the plans and sightseeing. But just depending on what they was a doing and who all they met up with could change whatever they was doing and where they was a going at any minute. So far, the trip had been nice and peaceful and relaxing and they all was having the right nice time of it. High old time in fact. Need I say more, the house that Ruth built. Buster treated all the boys to whatever they wanted to eat and drink, and thoroughly enjoyed the Yankees whoop up on the Baltimore Orioles. Old Buster was just having himself a fit of jumping up and down and hollering whilst they watched a special event in baseball history. May 14th, New York Yankee Mickey Mantle becomes the sixth member of the 500 home run club in New York, 6-5 victory over the Baltimore Orioles at Yankee Stadium. Mantle connects with all batting left-handed off of Baltimore's Stu Miller. Sixth stop, Washington, D.C. Well, Jesse spent considerable time in buildings having anything to do with the law. Walter gone around every witchy place and hired Cy Fottle through the Smithsonian Museum. Buster done got into a, to see a friend he helped campaign for running for Congress. He visited with them for quite a spell, as Buster's Grandpa Gus and grand, great-grandparents now knowed him real well, and Buster's great-grandparents was neighbors back home to him, his people. 
all the boys were going to go for supper with him that night at the old Abbey Grill. Well, the boys got all they wanted to eat, and Wilbur gave them a birthday present, and a card to Buster's great-grandma for him to take home back home with it. Well, the next day, Mr. Mills, that's Mr. Wilbur Mills, sent a car for the boys and said he had a surprise for them. It was sure enough that, I tell you. The boys were took to the White House to meet up with the President of the United States of America for a little dinner outside on the veranda. Reckon you can't guess who all was there, neither. Mr. Hired Holmes in the flesh. Mr. Mill stayed with them, and the seven of them enjoyed a hire long meeting of eating and talking. The President said he wanted to thank the boys personal like for what all they had helped done to, to help the country. And Mr. Holmes had kept him informed about their adventures, and Mr. Mills told him about all their families. The President then gave each of the boys a special medal in a wood box with the presidential seal carved in it for their service to their country. Then the President had to leave and shook hands with the boys and Mr. Holmes and said he was going to take them to the train station. The boys said their goodbyes to Mr. Mills, thanked him for everything and left on out. Now, Mr. Holmes said him and Dalton and Devane was going to stop in one day soon to tell their folks they was a coming with an appetite too. Washington was a right memorable experience. There was a letter that Mr. Holmes gave to each of the boys and they was, uh, as they was aboarding that train. He said to open them later. Well, all the boys told Mr. Holmes he was uh, a sight for sore, sight for sore eyes and it was sure good to see him again and to come on down as soon as he could to see him up. Now them letters was quite the thing. Jesse got an invite from the Attorney General and the Supreme Court to visit and had an intern job with him when he graduated to law school at the University of Alabama. Walter then got made an honorary memory, a member of the U.S. Cavalry and a standing invitation to ride his and Gray in any government procession involving horses. Well, Howard got an invite to help out with the projects with the Navy CBs and the U.S. Corps of Engineers, and best of all, appointed as a liaison for the National Academy of Sciences to the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Well, now Buster got more than he bargained for. Mr. Holmes was to see if and Buster went into doctrine or politics or whichever he done or both. He was going to see that he had his chance to do what he wanted. Buster told the boys about all he figured to do with farm or chop wood, but might go on to school because he didn't like them things too much. But he did like chopping wood and farming. Well, what the boys did not know was that Mr. Holmes done had all the test results the boys took at the school house. He knowed exactly what was their specialty and interest and especially since he had been in all the things they done with the presidential court. Well, the boys learned they later on that Mr. Holmes said about the only thing that could muddy the water for the boys was a woman. How true that was. Seven stops, Savannah, Georgia. Now, there was some sure enough talking and speculating on the ride to Savannah, I'm here to tell you. It'd be good to see Bebe and her folks and visit for a spell. They all agreed they might stay over for a bit if and it worked out that way. Jesse called to see if and B.B. was around and wanted to see the boys. Sure enough was having a fit to see Jesse. Them pheromones of his and was a beating them there and <laughs> doing their magic on them women folk. No doubt about that. B.B.'s ma said to get on over there and be quick about it too. She sent B.B. and her pa to fetch the boys and said she would have supper waiting on table when they got there. The boys got them a room after they was picked up by B.B. and her pa and then cleaned up a mite and changed them some clothes. True to her word, Miss Evelyn had the table set and supper on the table when they all got to their house. Frank, Beebe's pa, brought out a bottle of old McBrayer after supper and they all sat around in the living room with drinks and the boys got to telling all about the trip. Well, everybody got caught up on family and business and all and when they looked up, it was nearly two in the morning. Well, Frank and Beebe took the boys back to their hotel and they made it up with Beebe to take a tour of the city and see the sights the next day. Of course, she had a car and would do the driving since she knowed where to go. Well, B.B. told the boys the next day that Mr. Holmes called and was glad they could all visit for a spell. It would do her good. She was still on leave and wasn't going to go back to work for a bit, but was doing real good now. Her wounds was healed and she wasn't needed for a mission right now, so Mr. Holmes had her on R&R. &R. The boys made calls to their folks and brought them all up to date on their travels and what all done happened. Now, home life was a running smooth like, and the folks said not to worry none and take their time on their trip and be careful that they loved them. 
the women folk in the boys family was going to make sure them boys had loving and hug them even though Walter was a mite skittish about all that. Buster didn't care, he grabbed his old hate anyway and kissed him on the head. All the boys and BB sitting around and looked over where they was going to go. It seemed uh, like a right pleasurable time was to be had, and pictures was took, of course, by Walter and Hired, and was ready to be put in an album when they was developed. Some of the pictures of places in history are memories for a lifetime. They all took to a walking and had a carriage tour and had a very nice early supper and then went to a picture show. Well, after the picture show, Walter Hired and Buster went to a little country and western bar they found whilst Jesse spent some time alone with Bebe. Well, the next day, Bebe and all the boys spent the day on the beach at Tybee Island. Well, that night, they all took the supper and gospel music cruise on the Savannah River on the Georgia Queen. The old paddle wheel of churning in the moonlight with the mint julep was just the thing to end a perfect evening. Well, the next morning after breakfast, Bebe and her folks, the boys, uh, and I all said thank you for their hospitality and caught the Amtrak to New Orleans. Well, Bebe just didn't want to let go of Jesse and laid a lip lock on the boy that perked near cross-eyed the old boy. Them pheromones of his was popping out and had that gal all in a dither, I tell you. The boy sure had a rib old Jesse something about that kissing and him redder than the beat. He said he just had to figure out how to control the pheromones. He could make a fortune off of that. Reckon the boys was about to get in the perfume business. A stop. New Orleans, Louisiana. New Orleans, or New Orleans, or however you want to say it. Well, the boys hit the Big Easy, took a cab to the Royal Sinesta Hotel, and after checking in and getting spruced up a mite, the boys headed on out to the Commander's Palace for a late supper. Well, Buster said them grillers was pretty good and tipped the waiter an extra 20 bucks for, bucks for uh, the suggestion on getting them to eat. Now, it was a pretty fancy meal, but worth every penny. Now, them grillers the waiter kind of whispered into Buster Dare and says, says those things was grillards. I guess that's that French talking. Well, after supper, the boys hit Bourbon Street and did the town. In one of them clubs, whilst they was having a little snore, the gal come up to hire and began to tweak in his cheeks. Said he was right cute and wanted to visit with him for a spell. Well, hired being kind of... <laughs> Hired being kind of shy, I let out to the bathroom and hid for 20 minutes. In the meantime, Walter and Buster was a-talking to some gals that was on a trip to from Idaho. They was a-taking to the gals when, and a-talking when Hired got back and all of them decided to paint the town red. Well, they all sure enough did, I tell you. Whilst they was a-walking to another club, a feller or a woman, you just couldn't tell which, come a-stumbling down the street. He done fell out right smack dab in front of Jesse, a spread eagle and face down. Well, it weren't long till the police come up and had it, it carted off. Turned out it was a man dressed up like a woman. Walter said, now what's that all about? Well, all the boys told Jesse to turn off them pheromones and just howl to laughing. Well, there was a singer in the club they went to next that was knock day gorgeous. She was a Cajun and took to Jesse right off the bat. She see Jesse out in the audience, got a gleam in her eye. Boy, them pheromones was really coming on. Well, after her set, she walked by their table and winked at Jesse. Well, Buster jumped up and told the woman they enjoyed her singing, and Jesse especially liked that last song. She said it was just for him. Well, old Jesse got red all over a blushing, and everybody at the table asked her to sit on down. She said she could for a few minutes as she was on her break. Now the gal's name was Monique, now you know who that turned out to be, and was a right, nice, and friendly gal. Well, Jesse finally opened up and started talking, and his and pheromone started cranking up and putting out like popcorn in the machine at the picture show back home. Now the boys and gals all said they wanted to tour the bio country tomorrow, and the gal said she was off, and her people was going to have a cookout the next day, and if they'd like to come, Sassy Bone. Even Jesse voted for that. Well, the next day about 9 a.m., the boys drove up in their rented car they got that morning, and Monique come in her pickup truck. Well, Jesse rode back with Monique. All of them headed out to the swamps following Monique. She led them to a boat ramp on the bio near Perlington. Three airboats was there and took them to a house place a few miles up in the swamp. The house was up on a knoll, and the only way to get to it was by boat. Well, when they got there, there was Zydeco music playing and a dancing on a makeshift plywood dance floor. 
covered with uh, sawdust. Well, Monique Marie Thibodeau, that was the gal's name. She was a sight for sore eyes, too, was the gal's full name, and she told the boys and the gals her story of where she come from in those swamps and how her people uh, settled there. She introduced all of them to her ma and pa and brothers and sisters, cousins and friends. They all was welcome like family and joined in the festivities. Buster and Jesse both brought a quart of old McBrayer with them, give it to Monique's pa for the party. Well, after all the men folk tried to snort of that old McBrayer, they come to Buster and asked him how to get some of that there liquor. Said it was better than their own homemade. Buster told them the story about him and Jesse and how Jesse's family started making straight Kentucky bourbon whiskey. Said he'd make sure they got a case. Well, one of the boys brought up a big old 98 pound snapper and butchered him up and fried some and made some turtle soup and gumbo with the rest. Pierre, Monique's brother, jumped into a plywood box ring and sure enough wrestled a gator. Folks was a whooping and a hollering and kids was a playing games and a swimming too. Food was a plenty with oysters fried on a half shell, uh, fried and on a half shell, shrimp of all kinds, several different kinds of fish and boiled crawdads, corn on the cob and tailor salad and coleslaw, baked beans and sweet cornbread. You just couldn't name all the food that was there. Well after eating was pretty much done and drinks passed around the music began playing. Now Jesse done surprised them all. He went over to the boys playing music and asking if he could borrow that fiddle of theirs. They say laissez bon, laissez bon temps roller, whatever that is, it's French time, some words. Now, now the boys know Jesse had been a wanting to learn to play that fiddle but didn't know that he quite had the hang of it. Excuse me yet. Was they in for a surprise? Well Jesse grabbed a hold of that there fiddle and put on a show for the folks I'm telling you. The boy was about professional. He was right comfortable in his known skin and just kept on playing until the other boys jumped in. Then it was all Cajun music. Well Jesse gave that fiddle to a feller and grabbed Monique and went to dancing up a storm. Jesse was plumb lathered up time he was done playing and a dancing, don't you know? The boys was staring at Jesse with their mouths wide open so you could drive a bus in it. Monique sat on down and Jesse got that fiddle again and went up to her and began to play in the sweetest love song a body ever heard. Well, all the folks there just stopped and watched Jesse play to Monique and the gal come plumb unglued and teared up something awful. She jumped up from where she was a-sitting, looked at Jesse for a minute, and lit a shuck uh, just a bawling like a calf that can't find his mama. Well, after a bit, Monique's brother come up to Jesse and the boys and told him not to worry none about Monique because he figured he could handle on it, uh, get a handle on it. Well, sir, hired asked just what was the matter. Well, Pierre said she ain't never brung nobody to no family gathering in her life. They was the first ones. Monique had been a singing for a spell to make enough money to finish her schooling. She was going to be a CPA with a law degree and her and her folks just didn't have the money for her to finish school. She planned to go back uh, next year but her pa had a heart spell and couldn't work none and she was a helping out now so that took a lot of her money. Now Pierre also said that there was always somebody trying to hustle her. And him and the cousins had to go into town to make sure she wasn't bothering none when she worked. She just didn't cotton to that way of well, life, and it was an honest way to make a living just to sing it. There hadn't been no boyfriend since her high school days, and the boy she dated was killed over in Vietnam. It was a getting late, and the boys told Pierre they had to get on back to town, and wouldn't he mind getting some of the boys to run them on back? Well, the boys and the gals they brung with them all told the folks how much fun they had and dearly appreciated their hospitality, you know. The boys was to leave New Orleans about 9 a.m. on the Amtrak and was up early to pack and return the car and be at the train station a little early to make sure they didn't miss the train. The boys all said their goodbyes to the gals from Idaho uh, the previous night and uh, all of them said they were glad to have made some new friends and that they had the best time of their lives with the boys. Before leaving that night all the gals come to Jesse and told them not to worry none about Monique. It was just a woman's way and he didn't do nothing wrong. In fact, he done everything just right. Well, Jesse couldn't figure that one out. Well, right before they began to board the train, Monique come up with running to Jesse. She throwed her arms around that boy's neck and kissed that boy like she meant it. And old Jesse's eyes rolled back like winter shades in his head and that gal had done plum took his and breath away. 
Well, Monique told Jesse that ain't no man ever took her heart, but he did. She said she wanted to see him again if and he wanted to and slipped a note inside of his pocket. Well, as Jesse boarded the train, Monique called out to Jesse. Jesse Darrell McBrayer, it was love at first sight, me or me you, or whatever that was. Then she turned to run out the station. Well, now don't that beat all, exclaimed Walter. Walter and the boys all took their seats in their car, and Walter went on to say, he ain't never seen the likes of it. Between B.B. and Denise and Monique, Jesse had him a mile of ciphering to do about the future. Buster told Jesse he had plenty of time, knowed he'd sort it all out in due time, that he had his schooling to finish first and to settle into his career before any decision had to be made. Well, Jesse didn't say much, but the boys could see he was some dithered with all that carrying on. And Jesse said them pheromones of his and didn't help none, but only got him into trouble. Well, the boys all had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with Jesse about that. They told him it wasn't pheromone, but it was just plain old Jesse his himself. Well, Jesse said he didn't want to hurt none of them gals and didn't intend no harm or heartbreak to them. Well, Hire told Jesse that all this was part of life and it played out different ways for different folks, but he would find his way through it. Now, the boys would always be there for him no matter what. Buster told Jesse he ought to be right proud to be honored by the affections of all them gals. Not everybody could just up and find somebody to touch their hearts. Well, the memories would always stand in good stead for all of them the rest of their lives, so it wasn't a bad thing. Buster said you can't know joy without sadness nor happiness without sorrow. Be glad you're blessed, Jesse. Cousin Jesse. Well, Jesse said, boys, I'm going to send the money to Monique for her to finish her schooling and help out her mom and pa. What you thinking? Well, all the boys agreed that ought to be done. All the boys settled in for some thinking time and get ready for San Antonio. Now, of course, pictures were took by Walter and I hired at the night stop San Antonio, Texas. Well, Buster said to Walter that the breeze he was a feeling reminded him of the wind churn and him and Jesse's folks back there in Arkansas and Kentucky. That old churn just a swaying in the wind at the corner of the house making butter. Doggone it! That butter makes me think of butter-basted turkey, and that's Thanksgiving. That's when Buster and Jesse's great aunt would bring out the silver to eat with, and it was the only time other than Christmas that they used that kind of silverware. They was the ones used by Robert E. Lee. Now, all the knives, forks, and spoons was mother-of-pearl handles and handcrafted real silver. Dang it, I was hungry enough to eat a horse. Well, he's always hungry, hollered Walter, Jesse and hired. Well, after getting their room and a car for the next day, the boys hated on off to get Buster something to eat. Buster said he was hungry for Mexican food and he knew just where to go. Jacala's, and off they went. The boys ate their fill and Walter wanted to go see the Alamo and take some pictures. Walter was up for that, hired too, of course. And Jesse said he wanted to look around a bit also. Buster said some of them Kentucky long rifles is what helped hold off Santa Ana's army and them boys was from their neck of the woods. Well, picture taking was in tall order for Walter and Hired, and he, he showed them all of them what they took when they got done with them. And the boys spent the rest of their time at Six Flags and down on the river walk. They had a real good time in it, of it, and uh, was ready to move on. Well, after checking out the hotel and turning in their car, the boys had a quick bite to eat and boarded the train for their next stop, L.A. Buster was all the time a reading a book and a napping, as was Jesse reading, that is. Walter and Hired talked to Jesse when he got tired of reading, and they made up some plans and also did some speculating about the future when they got back. They all agreed uh, changes was a-coming, they all had some right big decisions to cipher on, but there was still some time to go before they stepped up to the plate, did what David Crockett said to do, be sure you're right, and then go ahead. The three of them all had the same concern about Buster. He just didn't know what direction to go in, except in where the wind blowed him. They decided to speak to Mr. Holmes about all that, seeing as how Buster's Grandpa Gus was set in his and ways, and his and Grandma Clara didn't allow much but supported Buster like his and Mama did. Well, Buster and his and Mama were right close, but he just couldn't live with her because she remarried up and her husband just couldn't handle Buster being there. So pretty near all of Buster's life, he lived with his and Grandma and Grandpa Gus. Time would tell, they said, and that they would be there to pick up the pieces if need be, even though they'd be big pieces. Tent stop, Los Angeles, California, Hollywood and movie stars. 
Well, Nancy Shepard come to pick them up for a night on the town and to show them around the movie studios and back lots. Well, Nancy told the boys she was doing right well and that she would forever appreciate them helping her out. They done made her a millionaire. Now, Nancy done all right of working and all, but Mother Nature's Gift of Youth Commission put her over the top. She done went on back home and bought herself a spread and outfitted the place real good. She took the boys' advice and made everything as self-sufficient as natural and what they call organic as she could for that day and age. Nancy ain't never married up and the boys said they hoped she'd find the right hairy-legged old boy soon. Well, Nancy told them there just weren't none to be had in these here parts, so first place Nancy took them was to the Hollywood sign. Of course, you just knowed every mud hole and crack was going to have his picture took by hiring Walter, so time had to be allowed for that. Well, Nancy called up Asa Wayne and told her, you know, they met her there, at John Wayne's daughter, told her the boys uh, was in town and she went to a howl and told them to come on over right now, which they did. Well, when the boys and Nancy got there, she said there happened to be a party that night and she sure wanted them to come. Nancy said she'd make sure they was there, and Asa said they would have a good time, but not to be through too surprised if some of the movie stars wasn't what they seemed on the silver screen. The boys allowed they could handle that. If them folks got to be too uppity or too big for their britches, the boys knowed how to break them down like a cheap shotgun. Well, after supper, Nancy took the boys to Mary Steenburgen's house, and Joey Lauren Adams there was there too. Of course, they all knowed them gals and was glad to see them. They had some back home. Mr. Factor was in town for a meeting and was there and greeted him at the door with Asa. The boys were introduced to lots of folks in the movie business and Buster's heartthrob Terry Moore was there. Well, Asa asked for the boys' attention and had all the boys and Nancy and Mr. Factor stand up front with them all with her. Asa told everybody that Mother Nature's gift of youth was invented and developed by the boys and that's how Nancy and Mr. Factor come to being in business with it. Well, they just couldn't believe it. All them movie stars, men and women, crowded around the boys and began to ask questions, and it twerked long to head a hopper. Started interviewing the boys, Nancy and Mr. Factor. Also, the gossip columnists got interviews with Mary, Joey, and Asa because of them being friends. Well, all manner of the folks uh, was asking the boys over to supper and out to have a drink and to speak at meetings. The boys had to decline and left all that kind of stuff to Mr. Factor. Heck, fire. They was even offering to put the boys in a picture show or two, westerns mostly. About that time, Buster's absolute favorite singer come up, Elvis Presley. Elvis told Buster that cream worked real good and he was glad it was a southern boy that made it. Well, Buster told Elvis that Jesse didn't come up with something for the hands. The new cream kept the hands soft as kid gloves but tougher than a boot, and it ought to work real good for guitar picking and karate as well. well Buster asked Elvis if he knowed of Leonard Banks, and he said, well, he'd heard of him. Right good fighter. Well, Buster told Elvis a story real quick like and that nobody knowed of the cream and he would send him a case if and it was something he wanted. Well, Elvis said he sure did. Just name the price. Buster said his money twerked no good with him. It was a gift from the boys. Now, old Gary Cooper was a nice feller and one of Buster's favorite too, as well as Rita Hayworth. And that gal redheaded as she was was a pistol. Now Walter and Hyde was all tangled up with them movie stars too and just couldn't get on into them with a jackhammer. They was stuck so close. They was thick as flies on a hog's back, but them two was a having a time of their life, the center of attention. Well guess what? Jesse Gunn got hemmed up with Mae West and Elizabeth Taylor. Both of them wanting him to come up and see them sometime. Well finally things got calmed down a bit and Asa asked if the boys wanted to say a few words. Well, Walter piped up and said Jesse done got the idea to make a new kind of perfume. When he did, Nancy and Mr. Factor would be handling it for him, and Walter gave her own tea. There wasn't going to be nothing like it ever seen before. Well, boy, that sure created a stir, I tell you. I told the folks they would be the first to know right here, and everybody at the party would get some for being so nice to them. Well, Mary and Joe, well, Joey told the boys after the folks left out that they sure enough was a hit with the crowd, and sure brought their stock up considerable in this town with their being friends and all. Well, Hire told them they was glad they could help if and anything they needed uh, to do and they'd be glad to do it if they just give them a holler. Well, Asa said she was approached by several business fellers to get her to get them in on the inside track of the boys' business. She told them, 
that they wasn't like that and would just stay where they was with Mr. Factor and Nancy. Well, the next day the boys hit the high society pages in the papers. They was a hobnobbing with the stars. Well, that wasn't how it was, but you just got to sell papers, I reckon, and slant things the way you want them to be. Seems like fellers can't even come to visit friends without a lot of hullabaloo nowadays. Well, the boys took all the sights in with Nancy and Ace as their guides and took lots of pictures. Well, all the boys had a real good time of visiting, going to Disneyland and touring the town and seeing the sights. That Queen Mary was one heck of a big boat too, I'll tell you. The boys all said their goodbyes that night, and the next morning Nancy and Mr. Factor took them on back to the train station. Well, Mr. Factor said to call him when Jesse got ready to release his perfume, and he would get right on in on the marketing of it. He said there wasn't going to be no problem at all with advanced sales, and if Jesse and the boys needed some advance money to just call him. Well, Jesse told Mr. Factor they didn't, but would he do him a favor and send some money to Monique? Enough to finish her schooling and help out her folks. Well, what ain't been said is that every one of the boys was already multimillionaires. They just didn't flaunt it none, and in fact, paid the money, no, never mind. Well, Mr. Factor wired Monique $250,000 and didn't let on it come from Jesse and the boys. He'd come up with some kind of story, he said. Whilst they was waiting for the train, Jesse also told his and Ma to send the hand cream to Elvis at the address he gave Buster. Now, Ms. McBrayer told Jesse it would be done today. Well, Jesse and Buster and Hired made up uh, around about 50 jars of the stuff one Saturday whilst Walter was helping his pa on the farm. Well, they was always doing something and working too. Well, Hired told all the boys he picked up some postcards and thank you cards and they all needed to sign them and send them to the folks that had been so nice and hospitable to them. Their folks dearly loved mail, so we got enough postcards for all the families and friends and told them to get to a signing. Jesse's mama sent old Elvis a dozen of them jars, I think, or so, and asked him to let her know if he got them. If not, she's going to resend them. Well, I dropped all the cards in the mail slot at the station, then heard the whistle of blowing, and the conductor hollered, All aboard! Eleventh stop, San Francisco, California. Whilst they was a ride to San Francisco, Jesse about balled up on Hired and Walter. He said, now you got us in a pickle. I got to stop everything and make that darn new perfume. Now you boys are going to have to help me because this ain't going to be no easy undertaking as I see it. And how it ain't never been done before, you know. I got some IDs, but that was all they was, just IDs. Now Hired and Walter has done stepped off in it. I just grinned, told Jesse he worked well under pressure and needed the challenge. Now old Jesse about popped his in court, and they all piled on Jesse after Jesse then got on to hire. Thing of it was, Buster was on top, and he was the biggest of them all. Both Hired and Jesse was a hollering that Buster was a squashing them. Well, after they all unpiled, they all busted out of laughing. Hired didn't usually get into messes nor speak out of turn like he done, but they all bet their bottom dollar that uh, their had to be a reason for it. Reckon they found out what that was real quick when they asked Hired why he done done it. Well sir, first off it made good business sense to bring it up in that kind of group. Advance and free publicity was going to make the company lots of money. Them movie stars would do the promoting for free, especially with them getting some for free and it being limited and all. Well the next off Hired said he needed something special for a special occasion. Walter asked him, what was that? Well, Hired said, for a wedding gift. For who, asked Jesse. Me and Alma May, said Hired. Well, when did this all come about, asked the boys. Well, Hired said that next June they was going to get hitched as Alma May was leaving home. She was there about 19 and Hired 21, and next summer was the ideal time for them. The boys was the first to know, and Hired wanted all three of them to be his best men. Old trickster Walter said no wonder Hired was a hiding out in the gents when that gal latched on to him there in New Orleans. The boys just howled over that one. Now that Walter was a mess for sure. The boys had a Pullman sleeping car and was on the train overnight. Walter done short sheeted Buster's bunk, but he didn't know him and Hired done switched. <laughs> well Hired went to get in the bed and the boy barely got up to his knees before he found out he couldn't get in bed. But Buster had a good night's sleep though. The boys pulled in just after sunup, got ready to get off the train. 
Buster had the Fairmont Hotel book for him and a car waiting too. Now none of the boys know nary a soul in San Francisco, but that wasn't going to stop them from getting around at all. They was all ready for the sights and for sure Walter and Hyde were going to take plenty of pictures. They picked Lombard Street for the first stop. Well, the boys meandered down Union Street through Chinatown where they ate them some real good Chinese food. And went to Fisherman's Wharf. The boys had an early supper of a smorgasbord of seafood. Walter and Jesse took to it like a duck to water and Buster done some real damage to the lobsters. He ate six of them. Well, Hired ate a little light cause fish didn't always sit well with him so he just got some shrimp and steak. Return to Golden Gate State Park seeing court tire buying doodads for the folks at the Embarcadero and Jesse Sci-Fodlin in the financial district took up the rest of their time before they had to leave. The next train left on out at 8.50 p.m. and arrived at 12.20 a.m., 27 hours of train ride. Plenty of time to catch up on sleep and any reading, letter writing, or business. The berths were nice size and the food was good too. Planning and plotting was a plenty for the boys on what they was going to do when they got back. And whilst they was riding, Walter hired Jesse asked Buster just what he wanted to do what he wanted out of life. Buster said to the boys that they was his family and best friends and he hoped they got his drift to his thinking. Well, Jesse knows about most all of Buster's business and history, but Buster said it was pretty simple for him. He knowed he was blessed by the Lord with a good mind and a body, but all he really wanted was a place of his own and somebody that really cared for him. He always wanted to be around the boys and their families too because he knowed like hired they was going to marry up. Buster just hoped the gals was good and accepted all the boys and their families too. Money really wasn't the main thing in life for Buster. It was what he called affairs of the heart. Now, Jesse lived for the law and business. Walter had the desire and drive to succeed in whatever he'd done and hired wanted to tackle the hardest jobs he could and take on that challenge and come out on top. Buster told the boys he hoped that answered the question. The boys rolled into Vancouver right after midnight and went to their hotel. Tomorrow was a new day, 12th stop. Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. The boys got a room at the Fairmont Pacific Rim Hotel for two nights before they left out to Banff. More picture taken and sightseeing was in order too. Of course, something good to eat had to be on the menu for their plans. The boys visited the Vancouver, Vancouver Maritime Museum, Playland at the Pacific National Exhibition, the Vancouver Art Gallery, the H.R. McMillan Space Center, Vancouver Aquarium, and took a harbor tour to boot. Vancouver surrounded by water on three sides and nestled along the coast mountain range. Vancouver is the largest city in the province of British Columbia with over a half a million folks that live there and has one of the mildest climates in Canada. Vancouver is a home to spectacular natural scenery and bustling metro metropolitan core. And it was on the Sin Sin restaurant for some time uh, after that for a fine Italian eating meal. A little snort of old McBrayer for a nightcap and off to bed. The train leaves at 7.30 a.m. for Banff. 13th stop, Banff, Canada. The Buster just had to bring out the information on this part of the trip. The brochure had this to tell them about what they was being offered on the last leg of their vacation. When the boys arrived there at Banff National Park, they checked into the Fairmont Chateau Hotel. Now this place was something else I'm here to tell you. Walter and Hired showing up again to taking pictures right off the bat. Jesse couldn't sit still and had to walk around and gom around a bit. Buster took care of the checking in and getting the tour in the car. And then they went to picture taking again. Hired and walked. After all the boys all got settled in and grabbed a bite to eat, they hated on out to do some exploring. Buster did the driving and he took them around the town to get acquainted with the place. Buster figured with the time they had left that, uh, that day that a good way to see the overall layout was a helicopter tour. Sure enough, they all had a blast of doing that. It was awful pretty and just downright awe-inspiring. Them Canadian Rockies was a place to visit again and again. Well, the next day, uh, the boys got up early and took off for driving to Jasper. And what a drive that was, 142 miles on one of the 10 best drives in the world. When they got there, they decided to stay the night and come back the next day. There was so much to see and do. And they got uh, a guide map about all the things and went to seeing all that. Well, the boys all agreed it was the thing to do to spend the night. Walter and Hired must have more than 100 rolls of film by now, with all the picture taking they done, and that's a piece. The boys had so much they wanted to do that they extended their stay for a whole week. 
the wine and food festival was going on at that time, and Jesse dearly loved a glass of wine or two. Buster took care of that eating, uh, of the eating, and Walter was right behind him. Uh, Hired was Google-eyed over the whole dang place and said he'd be hornswoggled if he didn't take Alma May there for their honeymoon next year. Well, there was all kinds of places to ski and snowmobile, fish, and just do about anything a body could imagine. Now, after they was all wore down from all this here activity, Buster got all of them into a hot tub, hot tub there, and a massage. Now that was something, getting Walter all in into that. Now if that wasn't a right, you would figure Walter would be the one to balk, but it was Buster. He was just right skittish about having some woman rub it on his body parts, especially around his begonias. Well, Hire just grinned and Jesse just shook his and hate. Well, it was finally time to hate for home. Buster, Jesse, Walter, and Hired had a really fine supper there at the hotel before they left out the next morning. They shared lots of good times over the years and know their so-called coming of age meant things were changing. Life was changed, but that didn't mean you couldn't keep some of the things in the past that were really important. The friendship of the boys had, uh, that they had over the years was one that would last for a lifetime. They all made a pact to always be there for each other no matter what. Well, there was still some transition time before they all went separate ways and started families. They intended to make the most of it. Walter allowed him and Lou Ann was going to marry up too. Well, Jesse was sure enough in a pickle with at least three gals and Buster was on the lookout for one his himself but still playing the field. In another year it wouldn't be quite the same and they all know that. But till then they had things to do and places to go. Well sir, a new day tomorrow with new adventures and new stories. The flight home was uneventful and the folks all said the boys was a sight for sore eyes when they come in. And all the boys and their folks gathered up and the boys rehashed their trip. Pictures was passed around and Walter and Hire said they was going to make copies for each one of them and have them put in an album. Mr. Ollinger said there had been a call from Mr. Holmes and him and Dalton and Devane along with Uncle Jeff was coming for supper one day next month. There was a letter and four brand new Harley Davidson motorcycles awaiting in the yard when the boys got back from Elvis. He said he overheard that the boys wanted to get themselves one apiece and he figured he'd help out a bit. He said to please accept his and gift to him cause that cream done the trick for him and he ain't never had nor heard of nothing like it. Them motorcycles each had the boy's name painted right on the gas tank. They were sure pretty machine I tell you. Well, right off the bat Jesse had the other three boys to meet up with him the next morning after they got home. He done had in his and hate how to make that natural concoction of his and cream and uh, that neem tree and some other extracts from plants to keep the bugs and other pests from running crops. They all went over to the chemistry teacher's house and asked Mr. Pugsley if he wouldn't mind helping them out a bit over the schoolhouse in the lab. Well, he reckoned so, and since he had the keys, they went right on over since he wasn't busy. Well, Jesse explained to him just what he was trying to do, and Mr. Pugsley knew right off that he needed a catalyst. When they got set up and things were brewing, Mr. Pugsley offered up some advice on some different things to try. Well, you would think this was going to be a long process. Wrong. That idea to put in a little camphor and castor oil did the trick after a few tries. The camphor sure enough was noticeable and the castor oil made the concoction stick to the plant and leaves like glue and wasn't going to wash right off neither. The next thing was to try it out. Well, Howard got a spray bottle and squirted it on a potted plant Miss Bennett had on her desk in the room where she was teaching Latin. Well, Mr. Pugsley went to Mr. Jack... Uh, Harvey's agri department where he noticed some things he had in there and got some. He let out, uh, he let them out on the plant and boy howdy did they skedaddle them bugs you know he squirted them Mr. Harvey's uh, plants there and even killed one or two of them. Well Jesse told them all that we got it and began to grin like a possum eating green persimmons. Now first off he called Doc and let him know they didn't got something he, he thought that would help out their situation with the crops. Well, Jesse told Doc they would get right on production after a few more tests, but he was sure it worked. Next thing Jesse done was to get uh, Omar Green on the phone to protect the concoction with the patent. Well, Jesse gave it the name of Four Winds after all the boys and the company name of Four Winds Chemicals. The next thing that had to be done was to get that dissipating ray gizmo to working so they could apply all that four winds to crops in the field. 
sprayers on the tractors, flying it in with crop dusters, or just plain hand spraying would work for application. But if you didn't get the four winds uh, where it would spray on and cover a wide area, it just wasn't going to be applied to the crops right, at least not economically. Well, Jesse and the boy know a fellow or two in the underground scientific movement that experimented in alternative methods of science. That's Buck, that's old Buck Rogers stuff. Well, Jesse made the call and asked for some help. Well, Mr. Lund and Mr. Cullen said they thought that with a couple of tries at applying four winds that they just might have the ticket for Jesse's ID to work. They'd been experimenting with something of that nature and would give it a whirl. They said they would call back as soon as they tried it on out. Well, sir, they did in about a week. It was good news. Mr. Lund said they used some rife technology from the 30s and Tesla's theories, and they matched up, and with their existing equipment, could make it work just fine. Frequency was the key. Hooking up a battery-powered light that was charged by an alternator would provide the power to run the light and frequency machine that could be installed in a tank. Conventional spraying could be done with the unit about the size of a backpack. Problem solved. Jesse also got Omar Green to handle that, too. Now, Mr. Lund and Mr. Cullen would share in the profits from their machine that would be packaged with the Four Winds chemical. Well, Buster told Jesse that all he needed was a little trip to get his and mine right, and now he seed how it all come together. Plus, he had a lot of fun. Well, Jesse had to admit that Buster was right, and to tell the truth, he wouldn't have changed a thing for nothing in the world. The boys all got them an RC and a moon pie. Buster got him four of them and sit up under a sweet gum tree down on the bio and just reflected on what all took place in the last two months. Well, Buster said Lulu was a Yankee, but he sure enough fancied that gal. And all the boys turned wall-eyed to Buster and said, you don't mean it. Well, Jesse said to take her slow and see how all that worked out. Seemed to him that Lulu probably wasn't going to fit right in at first, but it all depended what both of them wanted to do. Time would tell, he said. Just wasn't that serious right then, and she had her design school to finish first. Well, Jesse said he was a right Monique a long letter. That's all he said, just a writing her a long letter. But Jesse would tell the boys what all was in it, and what was on his and mine when he took a notion. There was a big party Saturday night for just the boys and their gals and their folks as well as the boys' folks. That was a house full for sure. Now the Ollinger gals with their bows and Walter's two brothers and their wives would be there for darn tootin'. They never missed a gathering. But Jesse was going to be in law school soon and the boys know time was a precious commodity nowadays, but the perfume had to be developed and Mr. Holmes sure had something on his mind. Well, Aunt Judith called and Elizabeth was going to take another trip soon and asking one of the gals or some of them could come up from the Ollinger clan and stay for a spell. They said they might for a week or two, but Buster's grandma, Clara, was definitely going to go, and if and she went, Grandpa Gus would too. Well, Buster would be on his and on for a spell, and he reckoned, and that meant he was uh, sure enough going to be at the Ollinger and McBrayer dinner table, that's for sure, a lot. Jesse said he was going to try to get the perfume made up as soon as he could and might have Mr. Pugsley and Mr. Lund and Mr. Cullen help him out on that as time wasn't something he was going to have a lot of in law school. The night of the party, Walter and Lou Ann come a riding in on Walter's two grades, Smokey and Stoney, for a moonlight ride. Well, I had brung Alma May on his new Harley Elvis give him and was as proud as Punch over that. Well, Jesse and Buster come in Buster's Ford and they was going to leave after the party in the Queen for Montgomery for the day. Jesse had something on his and mine about Denise, it appeared. Well, Buster said he'd see how all that turned out when they got there. Well, colors was a-changing, just a mite of fresh in the evening now. First snow wasn't going to be fur off. Hogs needed to be brought in, dressed out, and hung in the smokehouse. Cannon was about all done, though, excepting for some fruit and taters had to be dug up and put in the root cellar. You know, life was good, and the call of the Bob White and Whippoorwill was music to your ear as Red Foley began to sing down in the valley. Y'all have a blessed day. So Buster, he's a signing out. See y'all later with another story.